Okay, great. Thank you everyone uh, for joining this very special fireside chat. Um, I would like to first wish everyone a very happy Women's Day. Um, quickly introduce myself. I am um, HR leader for product and corporate global functions. And I also lead the inclusion, diversity and equity charter for OYO. Um, I am extremely, extremely pleased to have uh, amongst us a very special panel uh, for a fireside chat today. Um, we have with us um, uh, Bharti, Hanita, Naya, and Tejal, uh, who's moderating this session. Um, I will quickly introduce the panelists to you, uh, starting with Naya. Um, she's the co founder at the Good Glam Group, uh, one of India's fastest growing and largest content to commerce D2C housing brands, and also the founder of Baby Chakra, India's most trusted parenting platform. She was formerly a management consultant at McKinsey and & Company and the Bridge uh, Span Group, where she worked extensively in scaling healthcare and education ventures. Naya is a Harvard Business School graduate, where she was a Fulbright and Tata scholar. She's also a qualified lawyer from National Law School, Bangalore. She's a tech enthusiast, passionate about learning from and working with fellow entrepreneurs, and a big believer in women shaping tech. Uh, she's also been associated with Fa Facebook's flagship program, program she leads tech to support and accelerate Indian women founders in tech. Uh, welcome uh, for the session today, Naya. I'll move on and introduce uh, Bharti Balakrishnan. Uh, she is India country head and director of e-commerce enablement software major Shopify. Prior to this, Bharti was leading end-to-end -end PNL management of Future Group's omni-channel and digital commerce businesses across multiple formats, channels, and categories, including Big Bazaar, Easy Day. Uh, and Brand Factory, among others. Some of these brands are pretty close to our hearts as well. She has more than 15 years of experience with stints at Paytm Mall, Alibaba, Local Oi, and uh, Bain, and also Hellspring, where she was part of the founding team. Bharti is an IMA alumnus and a chemical engineer from Bits Pilani. She has vast experience in building and scaling both online and offline retail businesses. She successfully built, managed, and turned around PLs at both brick and mortar retail chains as well as scale e-commerce platforms. Uh, welcome uh, to the session, uh, Bharti. We are so glad to have you uh, with us. Um, uh, next, we have Hanita. Uh, she's uh, uh, studied fashion and started her career as a hostess while working with Neckerman on several holiday destinations for German, Dutch, and Belgian guests. Navigating through different verticals, including sales within Thomas Cook, she finally landed up in PR and communications as a profession where she started handling crisis communication. And it is this, it is here that she realized that her real talent and joy lies in this profession. She worked with Thomas Cook for more than 27 years. And in 2020, she moved on to a new challenge with our very own OYO Vacation Homes as PR and communication director for Europe. She's blessed with a creative mind and a big motivator for spreading the word through authentic people and channel uh, channels. She also has a strong affinity with travel, music and lifestyle and loves exploring different cultures and working with different nationalities. Uh, welcome, uh, Hanita. We're so pleased to have you. Uh, last but not the least, I'd like to introduce, I'm sure most of all of you know Sejal, but let me take a stab, a humble stab at introducing her again. Um, she will be the moderator for the session and will drive the conversation with this great, uh, with this inspiring set of women that we have. Uh, Tejal is an industry veteran who joined OYO as a senior legal advisor for India and South Asia as a first women uh, CXO and has created significant impact not only in her area of work, but also played a key role in nurturing an inclusive and diverse culture at OYO. She joined us after a 19 year successful stint as general counsel at G, where she worked across diverse businesses, including healthcare, consumer, industrial and aviation. She's worked in Singapore and Tokyo prior to relocating to Delhi in 2012. Uh, she's a solicitor at both the Bombay uh, Incorporated Law Society and the Law Society of England and Wales. Tejal is well known in the industry for her proactive management style, pragmatic approach to decision making, and the integrated one team spirit that she's known to instill in her teams. Um, Tejal, we are very pleased to have you drive this session and really looking forward to having some great conversations and learning from the amazing journeys uh, you know, that we have all uh, the esteemed panelists uh, have. 
Over to you, Tejal. Thanks, Kitika. I think it's my privilege today to really sort of go through the journeys of the three exciting women that we have, um, you know, on the screen. You know, this morning when I opened the newspaper, it really struck me that this was so different from the time when I started my career. Every page of the paper had at least 10 articles, advertisements, quotes about International Women's Day. You know, the page four had things about uh, initiatives for transgenders. I mean, it was just outstanding the way the entire world has adopted and wants to go down this path of, of you know, embracing diversity in all its forms. Um, you know, we couldn't even find, I mean, we had to at least go around telling people, you know, it's, it's March 8th, hey, do you remember it's International Women's Day? Um, and, and the world's changed so much since, but I, I think there are still areas where hearing stories like the ones we're going to do today um, is, is really going to help others. You know, we're not there yet. Uh, there's a long way to go. And uh, honestly, the role models that we're gonna be talking to today um, are just a piece of the inspiration that, that all diverse uh, people need all over the world. So I'm, you know, I'm excited and I'm gonna jump right into the conversation. Um, so, you know, as Yetika said, I lived outside of India for quite a while and, you know, the appreciation for culture only comes in when you're in it. So I'd really like to start with Bharti to talk about sort of in her journey, all the different cultures that she's worked in, both from a nationality standpoint, structural standpoint, organization standpoint, to a little bit lead us through, you know, are there cultural differences really? Is everyone the same at heart? Um, and, and what did you see in your journey as a woman through these organizations? Thank you so much, Tejal. And uh, good evening, everyone. And thanks very much for having all of us here. It's an absolute uh, privilege to be here, honestly, and share, share my experiences and uh, tell you about all the things I've done that are not so nice and not so right in the last 15 years. Um, I think when I think about uh, culture, yes, I have worked in multiple countries uh, and at different stages of my career. I was also worked in very early stage startup environments, uh, as well as in large corporates. And I think both have had an influence on uh, what culture can be, depending on the stage of company, as well as, uh, you know, what women are doing in those cultures, right? Um, some of my favorite examples are, I worked at a very early stage startup right after I had my baby. And people thought I was mad. Um, I was in a long distance marriage. My husband wanted to continue to be a banker. So I said, please continue being a banker and move back to India because I wanted to build something in India. And uh, I actually joined local OA and I was pretty, I mean, you know, I pretty much ran the business with Aditya, who's the founder. And I thought, man, I'm really mad to do this sitting alone in Bangalore by myself. But I found it the most friendly culture for a young mom because the flexibility of a startup was amazing. I actually brought my baby into work pretty much every other day. And there'd be like a whole floor of people <laughs> waiting to take care of her. Uh, not to say any of it was easy, right? Uh, of course, you have to you have to adapt the mindset that says this is good too, uh, which which came easily to me, may not come to everyone. Uh, but that's an example of, you know, I thought an early stage startup culture was actually very encouraging of someone who was a young mother. Um, in terms of multiple countries, I'd say China really stands out. I've worked closely with America and I work with Canada. Um, I've spent a lot of time in China and it's always struck me that uh, at least in the corporate world, gender doesn't seem to be a conversation in China uh, because there's so many women at work. Uh, it may be the lineage uh, of being a country where men and women have always worked. Uh, I think in my generation, I'm seeing more and more of that in India, but uh, not enough. And uh, definitely in my parents' generation, it was not the norm, uh, but I think it was in China, right? Um, so we see that then a few generations forward, it's, it's not a conversation anymore. Uh, I think Jack Maas famously said that he believed his uh, consumers were women. And so he wanted more women at work. And it truly happened on the floor. And it went all the way up because the founding team at Ali has many, many women. Um, uh, Jane, um, you know, the lady who ran uh, Alipay, uh, so many of them who, who've sort of like 
you know, really, really held the flag high. So it was refreshing for me to know that that was not, not a conversation um, at all. And then sort of look into the future almost uh, for what this could look like and truly believe that, you know, women can do anything. Women can be anything. They can be CFOs. They can be on boards. Um, you know, our hardest businesses at Ali were run by women, right? Like, so there's this classic stereotype of, yeah, you know, sure, HR is run by women right no it was b2b logistics like china was run by a woman like the b2b business which was large armies of people on the field were run by women right so i feel like those were some of the things i picked up that broke any biases i had even unconsciously um so both right like small large companies as well as uh indian and non-indian companies have taught me a lot that's great, Bharti. So then, let me switch a little bit. We talked about China. We talked a little bit about India. Anita, you want to talk a little bit about the European experience of how your career has sort of molded over the years and how you looked at it through the organization? You're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, sorry. Sorry. Yes, of course. And thank you so much for having me here. It's so inspiring to be uh, among all these uh, great ladies and men, of course. Um, I think for Europe, when I started working, I was I was 22. I started moving to another country and without my family, I felt a bit, uh, it was a bit weird for me to work all by myself, not having my family to support me. Um, and I came into a different culture because even though Europe is very small, every country has its own culture, its own habits, its own ways of, of, of working and living. So I started working in five different countries when I was still very young and I learned a lot about cultural differences and, and not uh, to have any uh, opinion about it, try to have not any opinion about it because every way of living should be good because it works for them in that country or in that specific region. Um, then I, I worked with Thomas Cook. I, I wanted to stay in the Netherlands again, so I uh, opted for a sales job and I became a, a sales account manager. I grew up on that department and became the sales manager. And then I decided that this was no longer something I wanted. The challenge was gone. It didn't really bring me up for going there every day. So then I, I told my CEO and my manager that I wanted to switch to something else. I, I wasn't aware what I was going to do, but just I wanted to switch to something else. And then they came up with the PR and communications job. And I was a bit, it was a bit weird for me in the beginning because I never had did any study on this. But I, I jumped into it and this was actually going from a, a vertical grown thing that is happening mostly when you're ambitious in a, in a huge corporate company. I went into a horizontal uh, function. So actually, I didn't have any new opportunity that really grew me uh, uh, on that way. So it was really horizontally that I... I then I had to report into the marketing manager from being the sales manager. So on the same level, I went into the marketing manager and I had to admit that a lot of people didn't understand this. They were like, but you always have to be ambitious. You always have to want to grow up in this company to go to move further and to be to grow towards the senior leadership level. But it really felt good for me because, you know, this job was not something I did already for a long time. I, there were a lot of challenges for me. So I could really start actually all over again on a horizontal level. And the company uh, offered that to me. So I think that I was very happy to have that. And in the end now, as you see now in 2020, I went to Oyo and now I am the director of PR and communications. And I think now I'm ready for that. So I think it's always very good to know that you need to do something when you're ready for it. And if you don't feel ready for it, there's no, it's, there's no harm in, in growing horizontally every now and then. I think that's fabulous learning because one of the things we always used to say is that career is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Exactly. And, you know, when people start off, the thing they're looking at is, okay, two years, five years, six years, where am I going to be? But you've got 50 years to work, if not more. So, um, you know, it's very interesting that you look at career in a different way. Naya, of course, went the startup way. Uh, she was married. Um, I think expecting a baby at a point. And she said, no, I want to just start something on my own. Do you want to sort of tell us why that is and why a startup? I mean, it's supposed to be tough, takes a lot of time, effort. I think Bharti spoke about it. She just said, hey, I'm going and went. 
what was going on in your head? You know, so uh, Tejal, before I, uh, I dive into my story, I just want to uh, tell you, I have a very special place in my heart for folks from OYO because uh, two of my investors, Devi Chakra, uh, and in fact, uh, so Mandar and Manindar were actually investors uh, at ba in, in Baby Chakra and they are at OYO, as you know. And in fact, Mandar was my boss at McKinsey. I think he's somewhere looking around one of these. <laughs> I can see, I, I saw his name come up. So, I, you know, I have a very, very special place in my heart for folks from OYO. And I think Tejal, of course, we figured out that we have a common connect with my mom just yesterday, right? So I think Oyo is quite a beautiful ecosystem. Uh, I have a lot to be grateful for uh, with the folks here. But, you know, just to sort of summarize and sort of tell you a little bit about my background, right? I mean, um, I think I was just consumed by the, uh, the problem I was solving for. Um, and I, I just had to build for it, right? And I think, um, you know, Mandar knows this. He's nodding his head. Uh, I'd been working in maternal and child health while at McKinsey. And, you know, it was a place and, and a space I became extremely passionate about, obsessed with, in fact. Um, you know, and, I, you know, my entire premise was even when I went to business school, how do I come back to India and build something that could be a digital, you know, ecosystem of care for moms and kids in India, right? That was literally something that consumed me, right? So I came back to India. I mean, literally, I think very similar to Bharati's story. I, I, I finished my one year, you know, I, in the US after, you know, after HBS, I said, okay, I'm done. I'm moving back. I booked my flight tickets. My husband was, you know, unceremoniously sort of booked along with me. So we just said, okay, we're moving back. And we did. And, you know, we started Baby Chakra and uh, I started Baby Chakra. And I think the first couple of uh, years were a process, I think, of number one, self-discovery. Because you're right. I think being an entrepreneur is such a series of highs and lows. And the highest highs and the lowest lows I faced in entrepreneurship, right? Um, I think the second piece was a, a series of, I think, events that make me very grateful uh, for the privilege of building in India and building for India, um, you know, because you just see, I, I think there's so many problems to solve. And especially when you're working in the mom and child care ecosystem, you're solving for, you're, be, you're becoming a part of families in India, right? So I think just to see the impact that your product is having at scale. Today, we touch more than 25 million families, right? And just to see that impact play out, you know, to think that this is something that you, that you and your team envisioned a couple of years back and you're seeing it come to life, a lot of gratitude. Uh, for, for having that journey play out for us. And I think a series of, I think, serendipitous moments. Um, you know, there was a time when we were like, do we go on our own way, you know, continue um, on our own path as baby chakra? Or do we become part of something bigger, right? And we became, you know, we chose to get acquired by, you know, my glamour that point in time, became part of the group, I became a co-founder. And the journey we are on is something that none of us could have anticipated, right? So it was a serendipitous moment that led to a conversation with Darpan and I that just led to something which is just taken on a life of its own and a whole new entrepreneurial journey as well over here. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, to cut a long story short, I think entrepreneurship is all about that, right? I think it's about self-discovery, about gratitude and about serendipity. You know, when you talk about baby chakra, I can't help resist but ask the parenting question, right? Have you actually dispelled myths about parenting in India? How do you think it has changed, uh, you know, in the country as, you know, um, as it sort of looks more at this, more working women, um, what's the change you see? You know, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna share a few facts because <laughs> that's how I, I approach things as well. Uh, I think two facts in particular that stand out to us, right? One is that if you look at the entire demographic of India, it's completely shifted, right? You're looking at an India that today is a land of nuclear families. 70% of India lives in nuclear families and that number is even more pronounced when you look at urban setting. Right. Um, and I think the second thing that we're seeing is this whole narrative about, um, you know, while, of course, I mean, traditionally, and even today, right, the burden of childcare does fall on women for the most part, but men are actually clamoring and trying to play their role that they need to as equal parents. Right. And we've done these surveys at Baby Chakra. We've done this across thousands of parents and thousands of, you know, many corporates with thousands of dads. And, you know, while we talk about, I think the challenges women face and, and mothers face, and those are real challenges that need help and need support and need solving, men also face unconscious biases about playing their role as fathers, right? And I think they get a lot of these biases from, you know, sometimes team members, sometimes managers, and sometimes friends and family, right? About why would you do this when you have a wife to do this for you, right? And the father's like, well, yeah, I'm the dad, I want to do this, this is my role. That's why I chose to have a child and have a family. 
So I think, uh, you know, so anyway, so basically what does that mean about trends? One is that we are looking at more sort of nuclear families and therefore they have their own needs. They have their own, um, you know, requirements. They're, they're going online in a very meaningful way because they want journeys and they want to make their own choices about how they want to raise their children, right? So I think that that, that nuclear family piece is extremely strong in terms of how they make their choices. And number two, I think fathers want to play a role today. And I think it's time that we as an ecosystem stepped up and basically supported them in playing that role and empowered them to play that role and not held them back. I think those are the two trends we see play out. And great for us. I always used to say I would love a wife in the traditional sense. Um, but Bharati, tell us really then about women at different stages in their corporate career, right? Because we talk about sort of women coming in after university, stars in their eyes, want to change the world. And then, you know, uh, how does life sort of take them through the corporate cycle? Yeah, you know, um, when I started my career at Bain, I think there were as many women in the class as there were men. Of course, I went to IM before that, where there were very few women in the class, but that was sort of a known fact. So I didn't think much about it. And I'm one of those strange engineers who went to Pilani, where there were a lot of women in the class, you know, one in three. So I never felt that there was a difference. And through my first few years at Bain, I thought everything was the same. Um, and then things started to change. And uh, maybe by the time I was 35, I often found myself in a room where there are fewer women, right? And uh, you learn to deal with all of it and everything's changing for the better and that's the best part. But I think that, you know, to the men who are usually more in the room, I'd say it's really important to recognize what profession, professional women are dealing with depending on which stage of life they're at, right? I feel like too often we make this conversation about women at work, about being moms and coming back right? That is just one aspect of it. Uh, I think thanks to our cultural nuances, the way we are brought up, in fact, I feel that plays the biggest role in how soon you're able to take on challenges, how confident you are of stating yourself. Uh, self. And looking back, I felt like the women in my class were the most underconfident analysts, right? They'd always say they knew lesser than they did. And it was not, it was just years of conditioning and that doesn't go away overnight. It's, it's better to acknowledge that and ask yourself as a senior male or female in the room, what you're gonna do to break that down and encourage people. And it could be men too, but it's oftentimes more women. Um, I also found that class played a big difference when I was at HealthSpring. Um, so just completely by accident, uh, we built HealthSpring, which is a chain of primary healthcare clinics to be a majority women org. We did not set out to do that. Uh, and it also ended up hiring a lot of what we call, I guess, blue collar. Um, so nurses, front office execs, phlebotomists, pharmacists, and then doctors. And we found during that process that a lot of doctors came to us because women doctors tend to marry male doctors and male doctors tend to over-specialize and the women sort of give up their careers to be at home and raise families. And we were giving them a chance to come back and operate in the clinic without having to manage it and worry about the capital needed to do that, right? Um, and the women just took to that like a fish to water, right? They loved it. Uh, and suddenly we became 70, 80% women doctors. The men are always happy to meet a woman doctor. The women were extremely happy to meet a woman doctor. It was great for business. But the same thing when you apply to the front office or the nurses, a very different challenge, right? Um, so a lot of nurses, for example, are dictated on whether they can step out to work by their families. That's the class of society they belong to. And it's important to understand that. So a lot of nurses came to us because they didn't have to work night shifts anymore because we were not a hospital, right? And then we had to balance and bring in male nurse staff to make sure they didn't have to stay late at the clinic because our clinics closed at 9 p.m., right? Um, or, you know, pharmacists, men and women would not eat together, right? That's the kind of class they came from where the women who were unmarried felt that, you know, if, if we were to sit and eat with some other man at work, there would be stories spread about us. This is so different, right? And as somebody who's in management, you're dealing with all of them in the same bucket. Their motivations are different. Their inspirations are different. Their challenges are different. And I feel that that is true in any company. And too often we bring it down to, oh, when she's pregnant, are you taking her to 
you know, client meetings or not? Are you deciding if she can travel or not? And oh, once she's, you know, taken a break, is she going to come back in six months or not? That is like 20% of the problem, right? Uh, and I think that's, that's something I've learned as I've grown older and my challenges have changed. But more importantly, as I've, as I've had to like sort of deal with different kinds of people at different stages, yeah. Oh, and, and you're right, it's, it's different biases and different um, situations at different points. And, you know, Anita, I think the popular conception is that, um, you know, people in the West don't have a problem. They're all, you know, happy, confident women, great culture, great organizations. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a victim mentality too. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Europe your journey, um, you know, in the organizations and where, you know, maybe you or a colleague has faced bias, um, you know, and how do you deal with that? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's definitely not true that it's easier in Europe. I think it, there's a difference for sure. Um, and, and maybe we are a little bit further ahead in, 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 in having women more in, in um, in, in leadership roles, but still there is a lot to do. Um, I think um, there's also a lot to do when it comes to, well, let's say bias on, on LGBTQI uh, uh, people in a lot of um, companies. I remember one once when I was in, uh, in Thomas Cook, there was a, a friend of mine and he was afraid to express that he was gay because uh, he genuinely believed that he wanted to make a career within the company and he genuinely believed that if I come forward by telling everyone that I'm gay, they will not see me as a full male leader, so they will not pick me to maybe become one of the biggest leaders of this company. And I really, I, I couldn't imagine that this was still happening. In, in this, you know, in, 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 the, in this era, I was like, no, this is really not true. But in the end, he proved, unfortunately, he proved that when he came forward by telling that he was gay, he, his ambitions, ambitions had to be different because um, they, they really didn't pick him for leadership roles. And, and that really made me so sad because that's, that cannot be happening in, in these days here in, in, well, in Europe, as you stated, everyone thinks that, every, that Europe is so much further already in, in, in this way, in a different way of thinking, which is still not true. And fortunately for him, he found another company and now he is in a big leadership role and there's no problem in him uh, telling what, what his preference is. And, and that he's gay. I mean, um, and I think the whole world should be like that. I think it, no matter what you are, if you're a woman or a man or gay or, or straight or you are black or white, I think we should really keep on telling everyone that it, it doesn't have to make a difference. You go for the best person in the best job. And I think that should be everywhere like that. No, that is uh, reminding me of, you know, what we used to say about children, right? They will do as they see not as they are told. So, you know, with that, I just want to bring the, the piece of the importance of role models. Uh, you know, if you see leaders who are diverse, if you see uh, mentors who are diverse, uh, how important is that? And, and Naya, we know you speak a lot about um, your mother. And, and what is really that role of the parent at home, the mother, the father, or you know, and we've talked about corporate mentors and things, but I want to know where does it start? Does it just start with family? I mean, it absolutely does, right? <laughs> I think everything starts with family. Uh, I'm also in the business of everything family, so I will emphasize that even more. But, um, you know, it does. And, I, you know, I, I, I've, Tejal, you know my mother, right? And I think what I love about her and, uh, and my dad's relationship, and my mother is unapologetically ambitious. And she's had her own aspirations for herself, for her career, for her self-identity. And I think she, she loves being who she is and she loves what she's passionate about. My father is someone who's also very, been very ambitious. He has a quieter ambition uh, than my mother. And I think his personality and my mother's personality complement each other. Now, why is this important, right? Because I grew up in a setting where it was okay to be ambitious as a woman, to express your aspirations and to be proud of them and not hide them. Uh, and more importantly, to expect from a partner an equal relationship. 
right? So, I mean, what my what I saw my father and my mother, the relationship they shared, the way they raised my sister and I, I think that obviously are the values you imbibe. And then when you sort of start looking or, you know, you start considering a partner, uh, you know, be it man or woman, uh, depending on how you how you go, you will look for the same values in your partnership with that person, right? Um, and I think that's what happened. I mean, you know, my, my husband today is someone who I have a very open chat about my ambitions with. He tells me his ambitions. We basically work with that in mind and we build our lives together. So, you know, I just think it's important. I think it starts from the family. It starts from the, on all the conditioning, all the conversations, right? There was never an expectation on me being this perfect daughter or this pretty princess growing up. It was about, you know, you have to get yourself out there, build a career for yourself, build a name for yourself, build your own personal brand, right? It was all about like, get out there, make something of your lives from very early on. So I think that is what we imbibe growing up and that's what we'd love to imbibe in our daughter as well. I mean, we were honestly in a panel of very supportive family because Bharti kind of told her husband, I'm going to India. Um, but Bharti just, you know, from the health spring days, from the fact that you're building this entire team for Shopify in India, right? What do, you know, how do you go about building this inclusive, diverse team? Any advice you would give to the men, uh, you know, as you sort of induct them into the organization, uh, you know, to be more like, uh, you know, the husbands that are allowing everybody to flourish? Yeah, it's a great question. I think about it all the time. Uh, I, I do feel that, uh, you know, and I've tried to observe this, I do feel that women who lead teams end up hiring women more. Uh, I haven't put the facts together, but anecdotally it does seem like that. And there's something there that I'm trying to unpack. I have to say in my family, my husband is the primary caregiver by far. I'm just uh, terribly not organized in my personal life and he's done good at it. So I let him take charge. Um, I think at work, I have never, um, I, I think just going back to Naya's point on role models, right? I think equally with the men, uh, I found that having the right model, uh, role models makes the most difference, right? Um, so it could be, I mean, when I was at a consulting firm, I'd often look at the partners and what their wives were doing. And that would pretty much somewhat define their idea of what the women in the team would do. Right. And because those partners now have women who are equals or working, I feel like that narrative is changing. And there are more male partners than female. Right. It's as simple as that. So I feel like the role models that men see are very, very important. And speaking about those stories and making them bigger is very important. Um, in terms of building the team itself, I think if we want more women to be part of teams. There's like 20 things we need to do and not one, right? It starts with, of course, you know, do you have a pipeline that that sort of makes sure that more women are coming through the door that you're looking at? It also then becomes uh, in the teams that they work in, are you creating the flexibility? You know, my example of local OI, I never in my life would have imagined that would have been easy for me with a six month old baby, but it was easy because I set the tone of flexibility uh, and what mattered was getting work done. And I'm hopeful that post COVID, this has become more the norm than ever before. Um, I think that it's completely okay to take breaks. I don't know why we make such a big deal of one maternity break, which is probably the most well-deserved break ever in, in all our lives. Um, so I feel like just being thoughtful um, and, and looking at people over like a longer term journey uh, changes the way you think about how you recruit men and women. Personally, I've not actively looked at recruiting one more than the other, but I have noticed that uh, even in my teams, I do end up having more women I can't say that I have a rational explanation for it at this point, very honestly. The explanation is the role modeling. But, <laughs> uh, you know, with that, I wanted, you know, from the family and the building, Anita is going really to Oyo, right? What is it in the Oyo culture that we should do more of to encourage diversity? Uh, what is the things that you actually think we should focus on? And... And what are some of the areas that, you know, honestly and candidly, you think we should really improve? Well, that's uh, an interesting question and a difficult question. It is, um, um, I think at the moment, I don't feel any 
big things that are not happening once you're a woman or a man. I think I think the leadership is is really taking into consideration no matter who is is bringing some something forward. Is it, there's not being looked at is it a man or or a woman? So I don't think there is a lot to gain, at least not in in the European part of the company. But also the people I work with globally, um, I think they're doing a really fine job. What I think. Uh, really strikes me is that uh, Oyo is more uh, is like a startup and and that I've, I've been working in these um, uh, corporate uh, um, companies where where well com- Thomas Cook was already for 175 years Thomas Cook so that's a, quite a long time so it was all very well established and and everyone was like thinking in in a kind of a direction and and coming into a company like a startup like like Oyo I feel like there's more uh, opportunities, there's more flexibility, there's more possibilities to, to and I call it learning by doing. You, you're not um, punished by not having a possibility on a career if you make some kind of a mistake or you bring up your opinion or your, your, uh, you think, okay, this could be maybe something that we could try at this company and we try it. There's always openness in, in, in these kind of things. So I, I, that is really, for me, that is really, something that I can work with and something that opens me up and I don't think that has anything to do with male or female but I I feel a very good vibe in this company um, and and not being any having any biased feelings on anything Uh, so that's that's for me it's really a really nice way of working I'm going to take away do more of what we are doing because we can always do more so um I'm going to do a quick wrap question for you all, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A, which is, um, you know, Naya, what does success mean to you? And what do you think you need to achieve that success? Because I think people's definition of success doesn't fit, you know, in, in a box. And we'd love to hear that. My God, you're all about the hard questions, Vetejal. <laughs> no, but I, I, I'd say, you know, my definition of success has changed so much over time, right? I think it first started off with, um, did I share this already? But I, it started off with saying that, you know, this is my mission. I want to build the largest, most trusted care platform. It was all about that, right? And like, I was like, obsessed with it. I think over time, I look around me and like I said, I think the second theme that just really defines my life today is gratitude, right? And I look around me and I have this amazing team. Uh, you know, I have these amazing folks who backed us, right, through thick and thin. Um, and I think what would be success for me going forward uh, is that how can I make my team realize their potential and their aspirations and, and, and make them successful? And all the folks who backed us in our journey, how can I make them successful? I think that for me would would really mean something to me, right? Um, and you know, people have invested the best years of their lives, uh, their opportunity cost, and their savings, right, in this this mission. And it is on me to somehow ensure that they find success from this. So I think that's how I've sort of. The, the, the definition of success has evolved for me now. So your definition of success is actually your responsibility. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> Harita, what would you say? Yeah, I think also for me, it changed so much over time. And I think that that's what happens to everyone. And, and maybe um, I believe that you, if you want to let it in and you are acknowledging this, that it can change and that it's okay to be changed. I think that's very important. And I think for me, uh, uh, for success, uh, if somebody that I have been coaching or that has been working with me is saying that they really see me as a mentor and they learn so much from me and that they are taking this into account for their future and that they have they are so grateful to you and, and really put this on their social media channels or telling this into their speech to others that really makes me so proud. And I see that as a, as a big success. If you can be seen as a mentor, I think I left my footprint where I wanted it to leave. And still many footprints to go. So <laughs> we're looking forward to that. And Barbie, you can have sort of the last word on this, but your you know, success has kind of repeated itself many times. So where are you now with it? 
No, no, you're being very generous, Tejal. I, I totally echo what Naya and Hanta said, um, honestly. And as, as I was telling you yesterday, I think um, my experience with HealthSpring really changed me fundamentally. I think till then I was a very checkbox person. I checked every box that the average Indian parent would want you to. Um, I was an engineer, I was an MBA, I'd been a consultant, banker, and then I came to HealthSpring and I worked with young girls who, you know, um, would start working straight after 12th standard, um, had very different aspirations, or, you know, women middle-aged couldn't be nurses anymore in hospitals, would come to us, or doctors, like I mentioned, it really changed me fundamentally, because I found a way to one-on-one -on -one, uh, learn to set them up for success. And since then, I've tried to carry that with me. And that's sort of become, especially with women, I'd say, dare I say the mission of my life, right? Uh, if I could find a way to do more of these one-on-ones and, and really leave an impact, and then they go on and leave an impact on five more people. Like, you know, a really low middle-class girl who worked with me who thought she would never be able to work after her, after she got married, but has continued working at HealthSpring since. Like, that's the kind of thing that, like genuinely makes me happy. I don't know if that's what success is, but that's what makes me happy. And I haven't found a way to do more of it. I feel I'm limited by the time. And, you know, I, I, I like to go deep into the detail before I feel like I can have a view on someone or something. So um, I wish I could do more of it. And I'm always figuring out uh, ways to do more. And if I manage to do that, I'd feel very successful. Yeah. Well, that's so beautiful because I, I remember when we used to do sort of these sessions years ago, people always talked about work-life balance. And at that point, I always used to tell them there's no work and life separate, mm -hmm. right? It's all about life, what's giving you joy. Um, and, and all of you are clearly doing work that gives you so much joy, um, you know, that it's not separate and distinct. Yeah. So I think that's, that's really critical takeaway on success, right? Because I don't know uh, whether everyone's defining it like this, but they should. Because success is no longer, I think, defined with, you know, money, perks, uh, et cetera. It's, it's really defined with the significance you bring. And I remember there's apparently a Harvard uh, course now, which is called From Success to Significance. And here you're actually bringing about the significance with the success. So I think uh, that is absolutely wonderful. With that, I think we'll move to a couple of questions that I see um, in the chat box, okay? So, um, Bharti, I think Richa asks, what is the culture difference you have felt between large corporates and startups? Sure, um, as a woman, I'm guessing, um, more specifically. Uh, Maybe that, that'd be a more useful take than just in general. So let me go with that. Um, I think I think there are, it's it's sad, but there's fewer women in both cases. Um, I think corporates, I, I firmly believe, have a huge responsibility to offer the flexibility to women that they need uh, as they go through certain stages in life. And equally, we should not, as, as employees, expect the same flexibility from young startups. Uh, who have a lot of constraints and are operating in that environment. I find too often that the, the, the conversation on this is too shrill. Um, I do feel like startups are doing a great job of creating a new culture that makes everything uh, more flexible. Uh, I think corporates have a lot to learn on that front. Um, they stuck a little bit in their old ways. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy to see so many startups create that, uh, that difference. Um, it is it is a lot more hard work at a startup. I think undoubtedly there's no stop and uh, start, and so you've got to be ready for that depending on the stage of life you're at. Uh, so that's something to consider. And uh, like you said, it's a marathon, um, you know, or I think of it as a jungle gym, um, you know. And and one of the things I think we we didn't touch upon, but I can just share personally. I'm going through right now. We talk a lot about raising kids being a big diversion. Um, Currently, I'm dealing with age-old parents who take up a lot of my time, and I balance that with the kind of uh, job I'm in right now, which gives me the kind of flexibility I need. And I think it's important to, as corporates and startups, also acknowledge that, uh, with, with especially women, because women end up being those caregivers a lot more than men, uh, unfortunately. 
Um, and so, yeah, I feel like the couple of differences are, I actually feel like the startups are far more conducive uh, to taking on sort of the nuances that women need at work, yeah. Well, I'm glad the, the change is being in scene. Vikas is actually asking a corollary to that, which says, how can we promote narratives around partners who have helped in the success of their better halves? And I'm sure this applies to men and women. Uh, you know, do we do it enough? Do we need to do more? I don't know, Naya, Haneda, you want to answer? Do we actually appreciate this enough, uh, you know, for both men and women? Um, yes and no. I think uh, the stories and the, I mean, okay, so how many, let me sort of step back a little bit, right? There are fewer women participating in the workforce today than they were in my mother's time. That's the reality of India, right? And hence, when you're looking at stories of couples that are supporting each other, um, it is even more critical to call out those stories. So I would say we're not doing enough already, right? Because the stories are fewer, uh, objectively, and those stories are not, still not heard. So we need to do a better job of talking about these stories because it is these stories that will set examples and you know, create the role models for other families to emulate, right? I mean, I want to call out another incident, right? One of the proudest moments for me as an entrepreneur was last year, when Nika went public, you know, there was a woman in a, you know, amazing pink sari, you know, basically taking her company public. But there were people who were trolling her and saying, you know, this is not Falguni, this is Sanjay at work, right? I mean, that is the level of bias that people have to deal with, right? And it was one of the proudest moments for so many of us. And, you know, that was one of the things that actually went viral in our family WhatsApps, if you remember, at that point in time. Right. So it is really important to call out more and more. And I think it's not just about these amazing stories of companies going public, but just look around you, celebrate the role models that you see, right, maybe in your teams, you know, and also like maybe control and, and call out the unconscious biases you may have. If, 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 there's a t if there's a male team member who's going to pick up his child from school or is on calls with a, with a sick child back at home and basically saying, I'm going to go and take care and let my wife continue working, please support. Right. Because that's how societies like ours would become a lot more equal. And hopefully my daughter's time will be back to a much healthier workforce participation rate than I have today in my time. And that's an interesting statistic. And Anita, I think there's a question there for you about how is the PR going? And I think Naya touched on two of those things. One is, of course, you know, the, the trolling and the biases that come out. And the other is really, you know, what we talked about the other day is about women being decision makers more and more. Or were they always decision makers and we didn't know? So, you know, if you can sort of deal with, you know, how's the PR piece going for you? And then how do you see sort of the whole shift of women as decision makers? Yeah, I think um, as PR, we can still do more. I agree with Neya very much. I think we can still do more. And I think not just women can still do more. I think men who acknowledge this can also do more on. Uh, and even I think it, it also comes with and then maybe that's a strong word, but correcting each other. If somebody is, is putting bias on something with, a, you know, sometimes it's just one, one sentence they say on, on when you're on, in the office and a, a colleague calls in and says, I really need to stay home because the kid has this and this and this. And, and it's a man that when others start laughing or start putting up uh, like, why do you stay home? Why not your wife? I think then as a colleague on the same work floor, you can also say, why? Why do you make this statement? Why do you have to say something like this? It's good that this is happening. And I think that is what I mean with correcting each other and, and telling each other that, that they're biased, just to make them aware of the fact that they're biased at that moment and they're, they're not in the, in the position to do so. And I think um, um, coming to uh, uh, women taking the lead, I think... Yeah, genuinely, I think women are better in understanding the needs of multiple people. Let's say, for example, in a family, they they really want to um, they really want to take care of the kids, but they also want to take care of a husband who can be, you know, satisfied and happy. They want to take care of themselves, and I think they are more. Um, they're not just focused on themselves and on a work life or a career life. They're mostly focused on everything. So I think they're genuinely more established in taking care of everything and everyone. And I think that's also where it comes from. 
So yeah, there's still a lot of a lot of stuff to do on PRing um, us women as being leaders in the world. And that actually answers Priyanka's question about workplace bias, and in, in sort of calling it out is what you're saying uh, yeah. when it happens, and and not let it slide. Right. Uh, another even question. If not, even if it's not you that is in mm -hmm. there, call it out whenever you see it happening. I think that is very important. And sometimes it's it's that unconscious bias, right? I mean, people aren't meaning it, they don't realize it, and if you don't call it out, they will continue to make sort of the same error uh, again and again. So, Varthi, another question that came up was, you know, these last two years of COVID, uh, however terrible it was, it obviously changed the way we work and working from home. Uh, and there's always sort of two thoughts around it. And the question really is, do you think flexibility to work from home has helped women manage their work and res personal responsibilities better or not? Gosh, I think that's a loaded question in India, like most things <laughs> in India, right? It, unfortunately, it depends genuinely. Um, I think I'd love to believe that it has because I've benefited personally hugely from it. But that's also because I have a huge support environment at home. I love, have a lot of staff and they've been able to take on the work just as is. And I've actually freed up time from commute to spend more time with my family, right? So it looks great for me. But I, unfortunately, I don't think that's the truth for the majority. Um, I think in many cases, women have had to take on more home load, therefore giving up more workload. And they've had fewer degrees of freedom uh, because they, they've not really stepped away from home and things that they did independently have been actually curbed. Um, so it really is a function of the of the of, of almost a culture that that exists at home, uh, and I think I'd be very wrong to say that I'm sort of the mainstream example. I wish that was true, but it's not. You know, and as we are now emerging out of it, um, I think organizations continue need to continue to have more dialogue around what sort of the the new world is going to look like. Uh, you know, we don't have to default back to the old one. Uh, and it's almost a chance to sort of create a, a, a brave new world. So we're looking forward to that. I think that sort of wraps the, the questions. But I, I know that I, you know, myself would just love to continue to talk uh, about this because we're trying to condense, you know, in about 40 minutes, you know, a, a lifetime of this. And little experiences and, and large experiences are all that we learn from and we learn from each other. Um, what is really wonderful is that we have a number of our male colleagues uh, watching this. Uh, and, I, and I do know that, you know, in many cases people want to do right, but they don't quite know how. And I think more dialogues and along various aspects of diversity, not just gender, um, is, is something that's important for any organization. And, you know, it could be diversity of thought, diversity of uh, uh, personality, um, you know, all sorts of diversity on the table uh, and, and opening up our eyes to that. But absolutely wonderful talking to you. With that, I'll hand over to Githika. Thanks so much, Tejal and um, Bharti, Hanita. Uh, Naya for an amazing, amazing discussion. I have actually noted down quite a few takeaways from this. Um, and, uh, you know, just personally, what really echoed with me uh, during the session is understanding and acknowledging, you know, some of these biases that exist. We cannot take the high road and say that these biases don't exist. They exist in, in different forms and these forms change, you know, as we progress in our careers. But just being conscious about them being sensitive and talking more about it really makes a lot of difference. So once you are in that situation at some point, you can always, you know, keep that in mind and make a more conscious decision, right? And and I and what I really also liked, uh, you know, or learned from this discussion is that it's it's a mar our careers are a marathon, right? It's not a sprint. So you know, success is 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 contextual successes. Uh, you know, keeps changing with what stage in life you are. And, um, you know, you could all be moving horizontally, 
gaining a lot of experience like bharti spoke about her career um uh, naya as well as well as hanita who's you know grown both vertically and taken horizontal uh, you know role changes as well and how that's enriched their experiences in life um and then of course i think the biggest thing for me has been uh, you know just following your passion and putting try and put yourself first right and of course it's it's diff- it's easier said than done uh, but um, you know uh, trying to work out a support system that works for you and you know that can enable you to be the best at what you are i think those are the things i personally learned from this conversation i would like to thank all the panelists uh, for this amazing conversation and thank you tejal for um uh, running the show so well um at least i am taking a lot uh, to ponder over and and think about from this discussion and i'm sure others have also learned a lot from your inspiring story so uh, thank you so much thank you thank you thank you all thanks thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.